How is, how is everybody today? Everybody good? It was a beautiful morning, wasn't it? Yes. Might change, but it's beautiful now. <laughs> Driving through, I, I came in from Fairview, and this is my favorite time of the year in the Southern Appalachians. You know, I'm, I'm a Connecticut kid, and I love being here. And I, I never thought anything could beat fall in New England. And how many of you know fall in New England? That smell, that's just, the, but spring in the Southern Appalachians is pretty incredible. And the thing I notice this time of year when I'm driving is looking out at the mountains and seeing all the different hues of green, which is really incredible. Everything from yellow to dark green and everything in between. And it's really fascinating. And someone like my student Armin, who's in the back there, can tell you by the color which trees they are from a few miles out. Right, Armin? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Th there'll be a quiz later. So, but thanks for coming out. A um, little bit, little background about myself. Uh, I, I like to speak really informally, right? So I have no problem with people standing up and asking a question. Uh, if I slip into jargon, please say, hey, Dave, that's a word that, you know, can you explain that word? If you want me to go deeper into something, I'm happy to do that. But don't wait until the end to ask questions. If you have a question, um, I'm fine with that. Uh, how many of you know your plants from this region? <laughs> awesome, I can say whatever I want. <laughs> this is great, this is great. All right, I can put the slideshow away. Um, so, so, you know, when you think of forestry, so I'm the forestry professor at Warren Wilson College. Forestry is what I do. When, just quick, when you think of forestry, what is the first word that pops in your head? Trees. Trees. Understory. Understory, thank you. <laughs> You know, a lot of people say chainsaws and, and, and boards. Um, those are important, you know. I mean, wood is an important resource, but my real passion and my real interest is forest understory plants. That's what I've studied. I don't even really care that much about the trees. I do care about the trees. Um, but my, the last 20 years has been spent studying forest understories. Um, they're really fascinating to me. You know, I have a good friend, my best friend from grad school, who's a production forester. And when we walk in the woods with folks, they, they say, you know, when Alex is walking, he's looking up and tripping over stuff. And when I'm walking, I'm looking down and getting hit in the head with stuff. So we make a really good pair. Um, what I want to talk about today, you know, I want to go a little deeper than just identifying forest medicinal plants. I want to talk a little bit about their importance and some of their really quirky ways of reproducing. Um, some of their ecology, some of the reasons why some of them um, have a hard time propagating and reproducing in these forests. Uh, and then we're going to spend a bit of time identifying some of them. I brought a bunch of different plants here, and not only the plants you're used to seeing, um, anybody know what this is? Black cohosh, which is a really important plant. But that's what people are used to seeing, but also give you a chance to look at them when they're seedlings, which they look completely different and being able to identify plants as seedlings is really important. So we'll take a little break from the slideshow to do that. And then, um, oh, and I brought, anybody like ramps? I brought some ramps for you all to eat that my students and I grew. And then uh, I want to close at the end, I'll close with a little bit on the management of these plants. Talk a little bit about what we can do to bring these plants back into these mountains and talk about some of the research that uh, my students and I are doing uh, in propagation around these plants. Sound like a good deal? Yes. Anyone have any questions before we start? I'm a professor. Somebody has to ask a question. Will this slideshow be available in? I didn't bring anything to take notes, but I would love to. Know yeah. That I'm not going to have to remember everything. Yeah. I got to check my spelling again. Did anybody catch that I, made a bad, I misspelled Appalachians on, when I opened it up and I had to fix it? So nobody, nobody caught that. Good. I shouldn't have said a word. <laughs> All right, yeah, yeah, I can make this available. I can give it to Pam and make it available. I have no problem with that. Uh, and you can, it. and you're videoing it. Oh, that's right. I have to watch what I say. <laughs> so, anyone know what this plant is? Blood. This is bloodroot, great. This is a bloodroot plant. Um, well, I wanna focus in, does this have a pointer? Oh, it's great. What, this, what I wanna focus in a little bit more when we talk about the plants is the seed pods, how they reproduce. These are really cool, they need ants to reproduce. And then talk a little bit about how the seedlings grow and how we propagate them and can put them out, uh, back out into the forest. So I wanna start with something that is not a medicinal plant. Although some people say you can eat this. Has anyone noticed that nowadays, no matter what flower it is, people say you can eat it? <laughs> Seriously. My students, it's like, Dave, you can eat that, right? 
It's like, you could eat the bumper off a of Buick if you want, but I don't know why you would want to. Um, but people are eating. The trout lily flowers people seem to be eating. And I saw a video of a guy, a YouTube video of some guy who said, uh, yeah, you can eat the roots, but don't eat too many because they'll make you throw up. <laughs> I guess if you need to throw up, maybe, but I don't know. But anyway, this is trout lily, uh, Erythronium americana. Um, so how many of you have seen this plant out in the wild? Nice. It's a spring ephemeral. I'm going to use that word, spring ephemeral. Do you all know what spring ephemeral means? Yes. Spring ephemerals are plants that come up early in the year before the trees leaf out, and they generally flower and make seeds and die back before the canopy closes. You know, so they're, they're early, early uh, their phenology, their timing is early. Um, I like to start with this plant because, you know, forest understories, again, going back to my forestry training, it's not just about the trees. These plants play amazing, um, give amazing ecosystem services uh, beyond just the value as an aesthetic, which is many, what many of us look at them. They're great wildlife food, they do nutrient cycling, uh, they bring economic value to these mountains. But one of the earliest folks, uh, Dr. Mueller in 1976, he came up with this Vernal Dam concept, um, which held true, because he was trying to understand how these plants fit into the ecosystem, because everything fits somewhere. I mean, that's something we all have to realize is that even mosquitoes have some purpose. I don't think we found it yet, but mosquitoes have some purpose. But what he was thinking, and this was done in New Hampshire, in New Hampshire, um, you can have fields, just slopes full of trout lilies, just acres of trout lilies on these slopes. And what he was looking at is what do they do in nutrient cycling? And what he, what he found out was there's a lot of nitrogen in snow. Right? And precipitation, a lot of nitrogen is deposited. And we know these eastern U.S. forests are uh, nitrogen poor. Right? That's the limiting resource. So what he actually found was as snow accumulates during the winter and builds up, when that snow melts in the spring and it has that nitrogen in the snow and it runs off of the land, the trees aren't leafed out yet. So the trees aren't able to take up that nitrogen. And so it just runs out of the system. But what he found was in areas where you had fields of these trilliums, which, uh, sorry, these trout lilies, I'm also, I say things backwards, so if I ever, I'm, it's horrible for a lecturer to say things backwards, but sometimes I do. Um, so catch me on that. What he found, this plant has these really fleshy leaves, and it actually comes up sometimes through the snow before the trees leaf out. It puts on its flowers, it puts on its seeds, but then all the leaves die back right about the time the trees are flushing. And they put the nitrogen back in the soil, which then the trees are able to take up and make use of. Which is amazing, you know, when you think about it, keeping nitrogen on the soil. So, you know, while it's not a medicinal plant, I just wanted to bring that up and, you know, I, I sometimes get up on my soapbox and try to get folks to understand that it's not just about the board foot of timber out there. These plants are really, really important to these ecosystems. Anyone know another name for it? Dog tooth violet. Dog tooth violet, yep, or dog tooth lily, some people call it. Great. So, what's going on with these plants right now is kind of tough. Um, they're being over harvested. This is a haul of illegal, illegally obtained ginseng here. They even got some money with it. Ginseng, anyone know what ginseng was going for a couple years ago? When it was at its peak, ginseng dried root. It was upwards, if you had good root, it was upwards of $1,400 a pound uh, for ginseng. You can't have this one. <laughs> and we'll look at these plants in a little bit. Um, it's gone down a bit. What's the average age of the stuff when they harvest it? I got the impression it's in the 30s. If you, now, if you get a plant that's in the 30s, this is, all, this is all really young stuff. You can see there's a couple bigger roots in here. Um, I could show you, actually I can show you a, this is a, you don't mind a little water? This is a two-year-old root. Okay. So that's a two-year-old root right there. Some of them are that size. Um, so what you do, though, what you can get though, this is um, bulk by the pound. What you're talking about is the big 30-year-old roots that look like a human body. Yeah. Right? The old doctrine of signatures. Uh, on some of the Asian markets, they'll pay $10,000 for a single root. One root, just they'll pay $10,000 for because it, it's whole body vitality if it looks like a human body. 
Um, but bulk, uh, bulk right now, I think it's going for about six or seven hundred dollars a pound right now. Is there any more or less bulk when it gets that big? That's, that's a great question. No one has ever shown that, um, that the older ginseng had, is more potent or that the ones that look like the human body are better for you. Right now what folks do is they'll cultivate ginseng in a, a more agricultural setting and it'll grow like a carrot, just like a straight up carrot, and you can grow the heck out of it and get a lot of it, and you're only gonna get maybe $200 a pound for it because it doesn't look like a wild grown root, but it's gonna have the same medicinal properties. Is it been proven that it's good for you? That's what they say. <laughs> well, yeah. I, 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 should ba I should back up, I, I, I should really back up here. I am not, I, can, I know enough about the medicine side to be dangerous, but my expertise is not in the medicine making of these plants. So I want to make sure of that. You know, I'll talk about the plants, and I know a little bit about them, and I'll tell you what it's used for, but I'm also going to, you have it on film. Do not take Dave's word that you should eat this to cure this. <laughs> right? I'll tell you what I know, but it's not my, it's not my expertise. It's funny because the students at Warren Wilson, um, we have an herb crew that takes the plants and makes the medicines. And when I have a stuffy nose or I'm coughing, they'll, they'll come to me with this cherry bark, elderberry, nettle, sycamore root <laughs> stuff. You're like, Dave, you have to take this to feel better. And I tell them there's only two medicines you need in the world. What are the two medicines you need? Yeah. Ibuprofen and caffeine. <laughs> if you have ibuprofen and caffeine, you're all set. And they're like, Dave, you're gonna kill yourself. Well, that stuff looks like it's gonna kill me. Um, I got off track there a bit. So, so over harvesting is a huge problem. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the ecological traits of these plants that make over harvesting and disturbance a problem. Um, so this is a huge trade. You know, Smoky Mountain National Park is doing some interesting things. They're putting microchips um, uh, in the roots, little scanner chips. And when they catch people with ginseng and they say, um, where'd you get it? And they're like, oh, I got off my granddad's property over there. They can run a wand over it and they can see exactly where it's taken from. So um, it's, big, it's big business. It's really big business. And I'll talk a little bit about what my students and I are doing to um, get around some, not get around the chips, <laughs> get around growing the plants to put them back out. The other thing that these plants are really susceptible to as forest harvest is disturbance. And, and I want to be clear about something. There is no, I, I, I don't have a problem with this, right? Harvesting trees is important. Wood is a really important resource. I think that the question isn't if we're going to harvest trees, it's when, where, and how we harvest trees is the question. That's how I, that's how I work. But, you know, when a site is disturbed, when you have these older hardwood stands, and you have these populations of trilliums and jack in the pulpit and ginseng and golden seal. And when that area is disturbed and the forest canopy is removed, it completely changes the environment at the site and the comp these plants are no longer able to compete anymore. And I'll talk a little bit about why that is. Um, how many of you own land that you timber, that you harvest? Anybody, you do? Nice, pine or hardwood? Pine? Pine? Both. Both? Good. At the end, I'll show you, we're doing some really neat work growing uh, ginseng under pine, which is kind of strange, but we have, a, we have a reason for doing it. Great. So a, a let's talk a little bit about why these plants are so susceptible to disturbance and over harvesting. You know, if you read some of Bertram's old travels, the, the botanist that came through here a couple hundred years ago, you were walking, he has, um, he has accounts of walking through fields of ginseng. Have any of you ever walked through a field of ginseng? I doubt it. <laughs> and just, be, it's a common plant. It was a common plant, but it was over harvested, right? This is another pretty common plant. This is black cohosh here. Anyone know what black cohosh is going to be used for? Did you have a question? No, I was going to answer your question. Answer. I was going to answer your question. <laughs> about, about cohosh? Yeah. yeah, please do. Well, it's used for uh, women, Menstruation uh, troubles or, you know, for nice sweats, all sorts of things. Yep, it's, it's being used as a supplement for menopause. And in fact, in Germany, under the, under the trademark Referin, it's actually a pharmaceutical that's, that's uh, prescribed by doctors. In the U.S., it's still being just used as a supplement. But right now, I can go out and find, you know, 
there's some pine around here, so it might take me four minutes. But in most hardwood forests, you give me two minutes, I can come back with a black cohosh. If the billion dollar trade in this takes off for menopause and pharmaceuticals, you think I'll be able to run out in the woods in two minutes and find black cohosh? You know, and that's, that's one of the issues with over harvesting. So these plants, um, I might make a little bit of a mess up here on this table, is that all right? I usually start flinging stuff and dirt flies and... Um, so one of the issues with most of these plants is they put very low amounts of their biomass and their productivity into sexual reproduction. These are black cohosh seeds right here, okay, to scale. These plants are clonal, and everybody's going to have a chance to come up and see some more of these, but I'll try and make this a little bit less. These, what do I mean by a plant that's clonal? It, it, spreads. It's, it spreads vegetatively. So this is a black cohosh rhizome right here that's going to spread clonally compared to what they put in from seed. So these plants um, put very low investment into sexual reproduction and most of it is put into below ground biomass and clonal reproduction. All right? So to start out with, they don't produce a lot of seed and to make matters worse, you can go back in there. Um, to make matters worse, those seeds, A, um, have very low germination rates. So even though you do produce the seeds, what we find is that in the wild, maybe 5% of them will germinate. But it's not a viability issue. It's not like these seeds, it's not like only 5% of these seeds are viable right, that, that, that won't germinate. The issue is they're so specific and they're so small that they have to fall on just the perfect um, seed bed to germinate. You get a seed that's the size of a poppy seed and it falls on four inches of oak leaves, what do you think it's going to do? It's not going to do anything. It's just going to sit there. It's not going to reproduce. Um, but what I found is if I can go out and gather these seeds and take them back to our shade house and put them in a bed with really nice forest soil, I get 95% germination. I get this. Right? These are two-year-old uh, germinants that we have uh, at the school that we're doing here. So these are, there's probably two or three hundred plants right here. Um, yes? You were talking about the trout lily and getting the nitrogen. What do these bring to the forest grow to the trees? That's a great question. Um, I, we, no one has really studied, and I have not studied, and no one has really studied um, where they fit into, if they fit into nutrient cycling. I'll tell you, I'll show you one, um, I'll show it to you now. Ginseng, ginseng also, um, a lot of them, let me, uh, let me show you what they do do that a lot of people don't, where am I here? A lot of people don't realize, hold on, what's going on here? I might be able to do this. Let's see. Where's it go? Do I have to drag it over? Hey, all right. This is, always makes me crazy. What I'm finding is a lot of people don't realize how great these are for pollinators. They're going crazy, and not just bumblebees, but honeybees coming in from our beehives. I've seen the bees on here, I swear it's a party. The bees are on this. I have actually seen bees get so crazy they just fall off onto the ground. <laughs> they just fall off. Because you can see they're going wild on this stuff. So um, some of these might be really important for specific pollinators. And I'm going to talk about another plant that has a very specific pollinator that we've done some research on. But that's kind of fun. Armin, have you ever seen the bees go crazy on black cohosh? Don't they get drunk? They just, yeah. I learned a new term too from one of my students. You see the little, the little pollen bags right there on their feet? I found out that those are called um, pollen, pollen pants. Do you have to have really rich soil? Yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Yeah, these plants need really rich forest soils. But that's a great question. We don't know what a lot of these plants, we just, we just, we just don't know yet. Um, but they, I, they sure have more value than just economic. All right, let me see if I can bring this back up. 
what am I doing here? Where's my mouse? Oh, this is when it always goes a foul. All right, it's got to come back. Ah. It's on the very first. Where is it? It's, it's in the middle of the screen. It's there, but if I come all the way over here, does it jump back onto mine? Maybe I have to go from that side. Hey, hey, I got it. All right. Where am I here? I'm here. And then can I just advance it like this? Awesome. Awesome. So, um, so low sexual reproduction and low germination. So if you're out there harvesting the heck out of these plants or um, the environment changes, they're going to have a hard time reproducing. Right? They're not, one way I think of them is the anti-dandelion. Right? Dandelion doesn't like where it is, what's a dandelion do? It can go elsewhere. All right? The other thing I should mention, all the plants I'm talking about, are, um, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, they're all perennials. Right? They're all, you all know perennials versus annuals, they're all perennials. They're actually um, perennial cryptogeophytes. There's my $10 word for you. Crypto meaning you don't see them all the time and geophytes meaning they live below ground. So this is another great, um, this, is, this, this guy, this guy thought he had me. This is another um, problem with these plants is they have really limited dispersal capabilities. So this is bloodroot seeds. These are bloodroot seeds right here. And they have this little starchy, sugary appendage called uh, an uh, ale ale ha, aleosome, an aleosome right here. It's starchy and sugary, and it's an attractant to ants. This is actually, I was sitting um, at school collecting uh, bloodroot seeds, putting them in a bucket between my knees and gathering seeds, and I caught this fella stealing them out of the bucket. <laughs> Seriously. Um, so, so that was kind of interesting. You can see this is what he wants. Um, that is a very specific um, relationship between the ant and the blood root. The ants don't care about the seed. They don't care about this at all. What they want is this. And they will take that seed and they will bring it back into their holes, eat this appendage off it, leave the seed below ground, and it'll germinate. Which is pretty fascinating. But think about it this way. Here's your first quiz. There's always a quiz in my class. How far, what's the average dispersal distance of a seed by ant? It's called mermicory. Mermicory is the type of dispersal mechanism. What is the average distance an ant disperses a seed in the southern Appalachians? Less than 20 feet. Anybody else? It's about a meter. About a meter. So think about it. If this if this plant, the dispersal rate of this plant, you have seeds that don't have uh, the low reproductive uh, input, output. You have seeds that have to fall in a special germination bed and they don't travel far from the, from the parent. If that environment changes or if you have a patch of something the size of this room and you harvest it all, you know how long it's going to take to fill back in. Um, the other thing about these plants, think about a plant that, um, think this is a wild ginger plant, and the flowers are really cool, but here's the flower right here, all right? Those seeds are gravity dispersed. So if you're gravity dispersed and your seed head's this far off the ground, how far are you going? <laughs> Unless you're on a big hill, you're not going very far, right? So the cards are really stacked against these plants as far as moving to a new habitat or replenishing and regenerating an area that's been depleted. And that's important um, to realize. I was having a dickens of a time getting these to germinate. I'll talk a little bit about our projects and germination afterwards. But what I found was they, I'd get, you know, 20, 30 percent germination on these seeds when I just took them out of the pods and put them on the ground. But then I thought, well, maybe this appendage has to come off. So all I did was I took these seeds and put them in a Ziploc baggie with some grit and water and just rubbed them in my hands, got those off, and I got 90% germination. So, what's that? They do have to come off. They do have to come off. Yeah, well, you get some germination, but if you really want high germination rates, they have to come off. Yeah. How many plants like that 
because I'm seeing this as a symbiotic relationship between the seed and that bug. Yep. Yeah. And I know there are other plants, uh, lady slippers, mm -hmm. that have something that's similar. So what percentage of that symbiotic relationship? That's a great question. Worldwide, I can't answer. This one here, there are um, two plants that grow around here that have this relationship that and twin leaf. But there's the acacia with the ants that grow in the acacias and when a giraffe goes to eat it, they just mob its face. Yep. That's another one. One of the problems that's happening here too is um, we have a lot of non-native ants in this area now. Well, we have non-native ants everywhere, but in this area we have a lot of non-native ants and the non-native ants come and eat this but they don't take them below ground so they don't germinate and fire ants destroy the seeds. So, so that's a problem. Why, why are the non-native ants increasing? Uh, the same as everything, human travel, horticultural stock, shipping lanes, being able to fly from here to Tanzania and back in two days. Yeah, yeah. I can give you a whole nother talk on invasive species, but I won't go there today. Yeah, yeah, I have a different opinion on invasive species than most foresters, but anyway. So, so limited dispersal distances, they, they don't disperse far. You do a 50 acre clear cut and there's a blood root in the middle of that. It's not just jumping you know, over into the forest again. It could take decades and centuries to come back. There's some areas in England, in, uh, in, uh, England where um, trilliums that were over harvested 400 years later still aren't in those areas. They still haven't gotten back. So when you have that clear cut, can you transplant what's in there? I mean, yeah, I'm going to talk about that. That's some of the work we're doing. Yep. Another one is really low photosynthetic rates. So this is golden seal. This is a bed of golden seal. This is one actually at my house. Um, golden seal does not like full sun. Most of the plants that I'm showing you, except for the spring ephemerals, do not like full sun. They want to be in the shade. We grow this in a shade house that has 80% shade, so it only lets 20% of the sunlight in. If you think, how much in a dense southern Appalachian north-facing cove, what do you think um, the average percent of full sunlight hits the ground? Three to five. <laughs> And these plants can persist in that. Because they have really low photosynthetic rates, they also have very low respiration rates. Um, so they can, have, they can have a positive carbon gain in a low light environment because their photosynthesis is above their respiration, right? As compared to Japanese honeysuckle or microstigium or autumn olive. Everybody get where I'm going with this? These sun-loving invasive species have very high, this one, this one photosynthesizes at about three to four micromoles per meter square per second, at about four. Um, some of these invasive grasses, invasive shrubs can get up to 12 or 13. So if you, put, if you have a full sun environment, if you do a timber harvest, who's gonna win in that full sun environment? Every time, right, every time. But who's gonna win in a really shady environment, a stable, cool, shady environment. You know, if, um, if Microstigium gets in here or uh, some of these sun-loving invas invasive species, for them it's gonna be like, you know, drink a cup of coffee and eat a half a banana and run a marathon. <laughs> you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna be able to handle it, right? You're gonna peter out. Um, so these low photosynthetic rates give them great capabilities to persist in these shady, low disturbance, cool, moist areas, but they're, they're unable to compete once the canopy's opened up. They just, they just lose to that, lose to those, those folks. The other thing these things are really able to do is, um, anyone know what a sunfleck is? You know what a sunfleck is, you just never heard that term. Anyone here dappled sunlight on the forest floor? You ever see how there's little spots of light that move across the forest floor? Those are called sunflecks. Well, because the sun can make it through some areas without any leaves, those are direct beam sunlight hitting the forest floor. And many of these plants, when that direct beam hits it, they're able to spike up their photosynthesis really, really quick. And photosynthesize really, really quickly because it moves on quickly. Right, that, that's moving across. So when it hits it, they're able to photosynthesize and when it goes away, they're able to drop down. Some of these sun-loving plants can photosynthesize at a really high level, but it takes them a long time to ramp up. 
So when those sun flecks hit them, they don't do much. They have to have sun on them. It's kind of like a race between, you know, uh, a Harley Davidson and one of those little Kawasaki that you hate having come up on you. You know, off the line, who's going to win in the first 100 feet? Right? It's going to go, but who's going to win in the long haul? The Harley Davidson, right? So, so these are the ones that can grow really, they can photosynthesize really quickly off the line, um, but the other ones have problems with that. You didn't know I was going to get motorcycles in here, did you? <laughs> I, did, I actually didn't either. <laughs> All right, um, so low photosynthetic rates. Um, they need these stable, shady environments to grow. What happened? All right, why isn't it going? Something happened. I guess I'll just hit it. Uh-oh, uh-oh, we're frozen. I'm gonna have to start miming. Hold on, let me see what's going on here. What happened? Let's see, let me go. Technical, I think I can do it. It's moving on the projector. Oh boy. I might have to close it and start it again. I have to close this and start it again. Sorry, I don't know what's going on. Let's see what's going on here. Let me close off that. Sorry about that. I don't know what's going on. How's it going so far? Are we good? Good. All right. Don't go away. Oh, good. We got it. Everybody got a cup of coffee? That's why I did that. Sorry about that. So low photosynthetic rates are another one that stacks it against it for overharvesting. Another one is shallow rooting depth, what we call the rhizosphere. Many of these plants only um, root in the top couple centimeters of the forest floor. Right? They don't send down these deep tap roots like an oak uh, would. And so what do you think happens to shallowly rooted plants when you drag logs over them? <laughs> it's, probably not a, it's probably not good for them. Um, uh, so, so be careful. What's a way you could mitigate this? What's a, way, what's a way you're still, you know, I am not, in conservation arenas, I am not um, a fan of either or. All right? Either or. You know, you might have rare plants on your property, but you want the timber value, and you're going to harvest that timber, and it's private property. And I come to you and say, yeah, but you have these rare plants you shouldn't harvest. And I say you can't, and you say you can, and I say you can't, and you say you can. Who's going to win? The landowner, right? These either are situations. But what if I come to you and I can say, hey, I can give you some techniques that you'll be able to harvest your timber, you'll be able to conserve these plants, and you'll get me off your back. That's not an either or, that's a, you know, and one thing you can do, um, some of the work that I did during my PhD thesis was, what about harvesting in the winter when there's a deep snow cover, right? Now all of a sudden you're dragging your logs over snow and you're not even touching the ground. So there are things that you can do in management, and I'll talk a little bit about some more management in a little bit, there's things you can do to mitigate the effects of this. But these plants, again, physically, they can't take physical disturbance um, like but that. We don't get that much snow. Down. You don't get that much snow here. I did my work in New England. Um, if you do have snowy years or frozen years, we get frozen ground. Another thing we can do is something called uh, dropping corduroy or dropping tops. So what a lot of folks will do is as they work through the forest, They'll take the tops off of the trees and lay them in front of the machinery and drive on those. And you can do that. The thing you don't want to do is work during mud season, that's for sure. During the spring, you don't want to work. But um, yeah, how many of you lived here for a long time? I've been here 13 years. You used to get a lot more snow. Yeah, so um, now I just get rain and lots of it. We have something on campus called the River Trail that runs along a floodplain. And I mentioned some people, we may not have a river trail in 10 years, and they all looked at me like I was crazy. But the Swannanoa has jumped the banks three times this past year, and we have to keep fixing the trail. So, putting a trail in a floodplain, 
is problematic. <laughs> so the next one is uh, these plants are really slow to reach sexual maturity. Okay, anyone know what this one is? This is the plant that everybody's looking at now as being the new ginseng. Say again? Scorpion tail? No. Uh, if, if it has that name, I've never heard that name before. It, it, this is called um, uh, false unicorn root. This is false unicorn root, Camillaria latia. Um, it's got these basal rosettes right here. So it sends up these basal rosettes. And then it sends up uh, male and female flowers on different plants. Um, people are looking at this one as the new ginseng, a whole body tonic, an adaptogen. Um, really high value, incredibly slow growing, incredibly slow growing. It has these, hair, these roots that are like, like kitten hairs. Are kitten hairs thin? What's got thin hair? Whatever. They've got these really thin hairs. You can hardly transplant them. Um, it, takes, it takes close to 10 years, 12 years for them to reach sexual maturity. So, you know, and they're long lived. They can live for 25 years, but again, so you are in the right habitat. You might have dispersed. Your, photo, your photosynthetic rates are right for the environment, but it's going to take you a decade before you're going to make seeds for, for new plants. You can see where I'm going with this. These, these, these plants are really um, in trouble as far as that goes. This is popular in the Asian market then? It hasn't gotten popular in the Asian market yet. It's popular in the US market. We think it's going to be popular in the Asian market. When I, there's very little of this harvested because there's so little of it. This is not one that's really common. Um, but people have been doing research on it and it has a lot of the same adaptogens and a lot of the same compounds in it that act like the ginsenoids that are in ginseng. So there's a hot list for uh, medicinal plant people and this is on the hot list. This is something we're trying to, uh, to breed and germinate right now at the school. Yep. So these are some of my breeding plants. I didn't bring one of them because I have so few of them I just didn't want to dig one up. This plant here, you would not believe how many plants, this, how many people this has been in front of. This is my teaching plant. I dig it up a couple <laughs> times a year. It hates me. Uh, but it's popular. So really slow to reach sexual maturity uh, is another issue with that. And then finally they grow in specialized habitats. Right? Um, so what day of the year is the sun directly overhead in Asheville? It's never! 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 Yes! I've been tricking people with that one forever. You know why I can do it? Because I was tricked with it. So I'm all right with it. It's never overhead in Asheville, right? 23 so, and a half. What's that? 23 and a half, that's it. You're at 35. There you go. So it's, you know, if my elbow is us here, the sun is always coming in from the south. Right? In the winter, it's coming in here, it's coming in here, it's coming in here, but it never comes up. So north-facing cove habitats are where you're going to find most of these plants. Right? North facing, in the shade, coves, con concave bowls are where you're going to find these plants. Um, and so these are the habitats that we really need to protect. You know, we have a site up at uh, Warren Wilson that's an east-west ridge. The south facing side of the ridge is just a horror show of invasive species. It's just, it's, anybody have a south facing ridge that's just impenetrable? But it's a perfect east-west ridge. You go down the other side and you go 10 meters down and the invasives are gone. And it's not because of our management. It's because of the aspect. Um, and so a lot of these plants are going to persist. There's some black cohosh in here. There's some anemones in here. A little bit of ginseng in here. Um, so these north, they, ha they have to be in these specialized um, cove forests. And the other thing about these cove forests, you all from, um, there's two types of cove forests in the southern Appalachians. Uh, anyone ever hear the rich cove? Rich cove forests? Rich cove forests are shaped like this. And those are really great for these plants because they're in a shallow bowl so the water doesn't run off them quickly and they build up deep organic soils because of the shape of it. Whereas we have acidic coves, right? And those are the ones that are V-shaped that are full of the mountain laurel and rhododendron and you see rock outcrops and they're, they're shallow to bedrock. 
those are not good for this because the water and the soil runs off so quickly and you get exposed bedrock. And that's why you get the shrubby uh, heaths, the, the mountain laurels and the rhododendrons. Nice. You guys want to look at some plants? Get up, look at some plants, and then I'll come back to management. Sound good? Cool. What time are we going till? We're going till... What's that? <laughs> till I'm done? <laughs> All right. I like it. Let's do it. That's a, that's a heck of a lot better than you're done now. So I just want to show you some of these and talk about them. Yeah, let me help. Sorry. No, no trouble. It's tricky. Cool. So let's look at some. Let's look. Here's where I'm going to make a mess. <clears throat> One of the first things I want to show you, I'm going to show you, I brought some different, a lot of people know um, uh, plant, anyone know what this plant is? What it will be. It's oh, in that Solomon bucket. Yeah. This is Solomon seal. I brought, some, I brought some seedlings of a bunch of these plants too because a lot of people don't know what they look like as seedlings. But the first thing, I'm going to make a mess here. The first thing I want to show you, nothing will be hurt here. All of these plants will be, will, be, um, will be put back in the ground. But one of the things I want to show you is if I hold this up, you see this structure right here? This structure is not the root. No. This is the rhizome. Okay. These are the roots right here. Think of it this way. Think of a branch of a tree with all the buds along it. Think of a rhizome as a branch of a tree that's buried below ground and then the leaves come out of it. So this is the rhizome. This is where the medicine is. And those of you up front, you can see the rings on it. You can count those rings just like on a tree. So this rhizome, which I put a shovel through so it would have been older, would be, here's this year's growth, which will leave a ring. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Maybe there's two more. So maybe 12, 13 years it took to grow that far. Wow. Right? Pretty slow. Um, if you look, if you feel this, feel that's a little slimy, a little slippery. What plant is that? This is Solomon seal. And Solomon seal, uh, anyone know what Solomon seal is being thought about now in the industry? It's got vitamin E-like compounds, so it's being used in hand creams. So people are interested. There's also, you can also eat this. And Joe Hollis up in Burnsville talks a lot about it um, being a starch plant, a uh, food crop, the cassava, that type of thing. Um, it has starch and you can't eat it. I just worry, I don't think you could mass produce it enough to make it a, um, a, a viable food plant. You can pass this around if you want. Pass all these around. The only one that's got to come back is the ginseng. <laughs> My ginseng, no. Can you eat the Solomon clone rhizome? Uh, you can as far as I know. As far as I know, it, there's, nothing, there's nothing to till you throw up. There's nothing toxic in it. These are, um, these are one-year-old germinates that just germinated of Solomon seal. This is a difficult one to germinate because it takes two years to germinate. Um, so you put the seed in the ground, it goes through a cold period, a warm period, it has to go through a second cold period, and then germinates the second year. So a lot of people put this in and they think it didn't work, but if they waited two years, blue cohosh takes three years. Um, the reason I grow them in these is because um, to save room, I'll put the seeds in, in the soil, put them in these, uh, these bread crates or daffodil crates, whatever they are, but then I could stack them ten high and just stick them in the corner and leave them alone for two years. And then I break them out in the second spring, and these just came up in the last couple weeks. So these are all uh, individual Solomon seals. And this is what a teenager Solomon seal looks like. And then can you plant them out? Yeah, I'm going to talk about that. That's exactly what we're doing here. Um, we're trying to increase biodiversity, my students are, by planting these out. So another one that's kind of cool, uh, you can pass these around, bloodroot. That's the one with the ant. You can see, you'll be able to see why we call it bloodroot. You can pass that one around that way. And you can pass that one around that way. So that's bloodroot. It's in the poppy family. You can see how red it is. If you have really sensitive skin, don't rub it on your hands. 
I, it doesn't bother me. If you put it on a really sensitive part, like the inside of your arm, it's caustic. It's a cell killer. It's got an alkaloid in it called sanguinarine. And um, anyone know what blood root's been used for over time? Dyes. Dyes. It's a great dye plant for the Cherokee. It's being thought of right now as breast cancer treatment. The problem is it kills all cells. It just kills. It's indiscriminate. It just kills everything. But back in the 70s, it was used in toothpaste because they found it whitened your teeth. <laughs> but it also caused ulcers in your mouth. So they took it out. But it's also, it's an anti-helminthic. It kills worms. So the thing about the medicines in these plants, you know, the medicine, the, what we consider the chemical, the mechanism in these plants, it's not used for reproduction and it's not used for growth. And if you go back to your basic biology class, plants and animals don't do things that aren't useful to them, right? So if it's not for reproduction and it's not for growth, what is it for? They're for defense. The chemical compounds that we use in these plants are used for defense, and that one, the sanguinarine, this, what's that? Oh, the, the sanguinarine, the chemical, that red chemical's in there, um, it's to protect this, the root from being eaten by nematodes and worms. So it's being used in cattle feed now. Thousands of pounds of this go get mixed into cattle feed to deworm cattle, just to prevent worms in cattle. Um, I'm working with the students. Anybody ever raised sheep? I guess sheep have some really nasty guts. They got all kinds of stuff in there. So we're trying to look at a um, sustainable way to produce a uh, dewormer for our sheep on campus using this. Well, do they get ulcers? Uh, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I told you I was a plant person, right? No. They might, they might. I'm not sure. The cattle, it's in, it's in cattle food and it's approved for cattle food and people use it all the time. So, um, but it has this distinctly, everybody's seen this distinctly lobed leaf right here. And it's really cool because in the winter when it first comes up, the flower will be right inside, tucked inside of that little lobe right there. But then if you go out early in the morning, if it's cold, it'll wrap around the flower and then it'll open back up again, which is really neat. So that's blood root. And then you can pass this around. This is a, this is a medium age blood root, whatever you want to call that, a teenager. And then these are blood root seedlings at the bottom, little tiny seedlings. And how long does that take to grow? Well, this here is probably, this is a good sized plant. This is probably a five year old plant. The little ones in there are one year old and the bigger ones in there are two year old. And none of these plants were taken from the wild. And I'm going to talk about that at the end when we talk about management. None of these plants were harvested from the wild. These were all grown by myself and my students. Um, what's next? What's next? Black cohosh. Showed you this one. This one's kind of cool. So this is black cohosh. Again, this is just the root, but there's this hard knobby this hard knobby bit in there that's the rhizome. But if you pass this around and look at it, another name for it is bugbane. It smells like an old towel. It smells kind of nasty when it flowers. But this one will be on the ground. It'll send up leaves that are about four feet high. And then it can send up a six foot high plume of white flowers that I showed you the bees were on. And this one's being used for menopause. It's being used for menopause. You can pass this around whichever way you want to go. How old a plant is that? This plant here is probably about 10 years old. But what you'll notice, when you, when you pass it around, what you'll notice, this is not four, pl four plants, five plants. This is one plant that's sending up, these are not plants, these are leaves, right? This is the plant, this is the part that persists. This is the leaves it's sending up. But as you pass it around, if you look, you'll see all these little buds in here that are all live plants, live buds on that plant. And I could take a knife, and as long as I had a piece of root and a bud, I could divide this up into 30 plants and plant them out and they would do perfectly fine. So you can pass that around if you want. That's Where would they want to live if you wanted to plant it? North facing, cool, deep coves. Yeah. This one is, out of all the plants here, this one is the least persnickety. This one you can grow in a shade garden at your house. I grow it at my house. It's really beautiful. Uh, but that's the one that's the least uh, finicky out of all the plants I'm showing you. Um, anybody, anybody want to eat some ramps? 
I had I, sh I asked, right? Don't now everybody it's gonna be like a Rolling Stones concert. Everybody's gonna come flying up to the front. Here you can pass these around. They're all washed, but these are ramps. If you have a social engagement, you might not want to eat them. They will make you stink. Anything that's on them is just dirt. They won't hurt you. I used to hear it. I heard stories about in the one room. I've heard stories that in the one room classroom years ago, when little Johnny showed up and had too many ramps, they just send him home. Because you stink after you eat these things. Anybody else want some? They won't, these, these I can promise you won't hurt you. If you don't cut the tips off, can you plant them? Um, yeah. Can I any little onion garden? You can't plant that, no. No, no, you can't. So where do you get them? I grow these. I'm going to talk about that. Yeah, we have plants available for folks. Want some more? Pass them around. I want one with a root. You want one with a root? Thank you. Has everybody got a ramp that wants one? Everybody have a ramp that wants one? Armin, did you get a ramp? Good. So, all right. So now I fed you. Now I can keep going. Um, here's another one that's really interesting. Where I showed you blue, black cohosh, that's black cohosh. This is blue cohosh. Blue cohosh, can I get that one up front for a second? This is a really powerful plant here. Anybody want to pass around a ginseng root? That's what a ginseng root looks like. So this one is a really powerful plant. The way you can tell them apart, the flowers are very different. You can see these little bluish yellow flowers. I'll pass them around. But the blue cohosh leaves are low, but you see how they're rounded and these are pointed? These have teeth on them. I could pass these around. Those will be up front after I finish talking and we can talk about more. I know everybody can't see them. But also the rhizome is very different. You see how this rhizome is kind of white and it looks like horns and it comes out? This is just a big block, right? This is just a big, big block like that. But this one, um, and again, I, I told you at the beginning, I am not an expert. You can pass these two around. Pass them around together and then you can see what they look like. I am not an expert on the, you know, I, I know what I know from reading, but blue cohosh um, had the Cherokee from some accounts used it for three things. Um, small amounts would help with menstrual cramps. Larger amounts they'd um, use to uh, dilate the cervix to help with childbirth. And high amounts, supposedly, they could abort a fetus. And so they would use it like that. One of the things we don't know about these plants that is interesting, like this one, this one here, you gotta see the flower on this one, it's awesome. This is wild ginger. You know, wild ginger is used um, for urinary tract issues. Um, the Cherokee used to use it to clean the kidneys and the liver, but it's actually got a compound in it that we know is harmful to the kidney and liver. <laughs> So what, I think what, what we don't know is they probably rarely used any of these plants singly. They mixed them with other plants, and that's what we don't know. But this is wild ginger. It's not related to the tropical ginger. It does have an aromatic stem uh, uh, root. Um, but this one's really cool. Anyone know the name for wild ginger around here, the other name? Little brown jug. Little brown jug, because if you look, this flower is on the ground, and it looks like a little jug with a fluted opening. So who do you think pollinates this? Ants. Beetles. Ants. Beetles. Beetles and ants. Yeah. So you pass that around. But look at the flower. It's one of the most beautiful flowers, I think, going. It's so... You have to find them. When you find that plant on the ground, you have to pull the leaves apart and look for the flowers. Which is fascinating. All right. We're getting there. Here's another common one. 
This is another common plant. Um, and again, at the end, I realize we're kind of crammed up here. I could stay as long as I have to. When I'm done talking, I can stand up here and you can look at these and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Um, this one's golden seal. People know golden seal. Golden seal is an antimicrobial. Um, it was good for conjunctive eye disorders, mouth sores. Anyone know what they used it for in the 70s? Pass drug test. Pass drug test, yeah. People thought that if you... People thought that if you drank golden seal tea and after smoking marijuana, you, it wouldn't show up in your urine. It doesn't work. I'm not, ta I'm not talking from experience. The medical journals say it doesn't work. Um, but it's, it's a really important, this stuff's going for about $85 a pound, $65 a pound right now. Check me on that. I haven't looked in a little while. But it has this, um, if you look at it, the reason they call it golden seal if you look at the rhizome after I cut it, it's bright, bright yellow. And that's the berberine and the hydrostine. Here's a, here's a piece of it. The same as all these other plants, yep. That one is really, really rare to find in North Carolina right now. Um, cool. Yeah, that's good. So that is an adult golden seal with flowers. This is a teenage golden seal. And these are golden seal germinates that just started coming up. So you can pass those around too. Golden seal, uh, golden seal is an important one. It was, uh, it was really important um, for Native Americans and it's used, golden seal and ginseng are probably the two most common supplements from the forest that you're gonna find. Yellow root's got the same compounds except it doesn't have hydrostine, it's got berberine. There was an old, um, I collect old medicine bottles from these concoctions and there was Mr. Smith's yellow root compound. The guy made millions off of it and it was an antimicrobial made out of yellow root. That goes around the wet areas. It's probably in a wet area. Yep, down by creeks. Nice. I have, okay, here's a ginseng plant. So here's a two-year-old ginseng plant. Um, it's got these compound leaves. They all come up. Now ginseng, where's my ginseng, where's, who's got the ginseng root? Pass it around. You pass it around. Right? Actually, what I can do is pull this one so you can see the whole thing. Did you chip that ginseng root? What's that? Did you chip I chipped, it? yeah, I did. I know there's some people in here I gotta watch. <laughs> <coughs> so this is a ginseng root. This is the ginseng plant and here's the root. Now this is not a rhizome. You cannot cut this right here and plant the bottom half and get another plant. This is a true root. This is like a carrot. You can't cut a carrot in half and plant the other half of a carrot. You can take a comfrey root, break it up, and it has buds on it. So this, is, um, this has been through two growing seasons. And you can see where this one's growing in the forest, and you can see how it's starting to switch. It's starting to bifurcate. And when it gets these different roots that come out, you get more money for the root depending on what it looks like but that doesn't matter on the medicine. It just, the, there's been no studies that show that a root that's all convoluted and, 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 um, and broke, uh, bifurcated into different pieces is more uh, valuable for medicine. A lot of the research is showing when you want to harvest these plants. It changes over the course of the season for different plants. They might be more potent after flowering, before flowering, but as far as the root goes, it doesn't. Um, I had a, a great experiment I wanted to do. We grow these in, um, we grow these in beds, and but if you grow it in a bed, it just comes down like a carrot. It doesn't do this, does this because it hits a rock or a root or something. And I told this, one of my students, Hannah Billion, I, was, I said, well, we put it in these beds. I had this great idea. We put it in these beds, and then we run like wire grid or PVC pipe under the soil <laughs> so that whenever it hits it, it turns. <laughs> and then when we get it, we can pull it up, and it'll look like it was growing in the forest. And she said, she said, Dave, I love Warren Wilson so, students. She said, Dave, that will, we, that will never work because the medicine always knows. <laughs> so I didn't do it. So I didn't do it. I think, I think it's a great idea. <laughs> I, I You're going to go home and try it. Lost wax casting, right? You know. Yeah. It, I mean, it sounds like it makes sense. Um, Is there any place you can buy ginseng? Like, to, to plant? I will talk about that. The herb oh. test in Asheville, yeah. there's usually someone there is. made the herb test in I'm going to talk to you about the program we're doing, and this is not a pitch. I'm going to talk to you about the program we're doing, but most of the plants that you buy come from the wild. 
we are growing through the students, through research, we're growing and propagating all these plants from seed to make available to landowners to outplant. So I'll talk about that. Okay, okay. Does it Dave, is there oh, sorry. a way that ginseng can be harvested and still be viable? The same plant? Right. There's some people who, their ginsenoids are in the leaves. So some people say, let's just harvest the leaves and leave the root in the ground. The problem is, do you know how many garbage bags full of dried leaves it would take to make a pound. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. Some people, I know, uh, I know, I know Todd Elliott has worked a little bit with cutting off the crown, cutting off the crown. Hasn't he worked with cutting off the crown and being able to replant the ginseng crown and it still roots? I'm not sure. I think he talked to me about it. But generally speaking, it's a carrot. It's a carrot. You can't cut it up and replant a carrot um, is how it works. You can get a carrot to grow. <laughs> Kids do it if you if you cut from the top off. from that very top, and some people are looking at that with ginseng. So um, the ramps, the ramps are really cool. What the Cherokee did with the ramps, they would leave the bulb in the ground and only pull the tops. We all pull we pull the whole plant, but they had a special tool on a stick that had this V that was sharp, and they would find they would find the uh, here's a ramp. They would find the ramp in the ground, and they'd go at an angle and cut the leaf right above the top of the bulb and just eat the leaves and leave the bulb in the ground. So that's a way that they would do it. I'm going to pass this around. I'm going to pass this around. I'm not going to tell you what it is. But you'll, you'll have my undying respect for the person who can tell me what common plant that is. It's a germinate. It's a germinate. So it's not what you would see when it was adult. That's another quiz. I love quizzes. Um, is it is. Our students make something called fire cider out of it. I don't know what's in fire cider, but they always... Horseradish, does, horseradish is not native. Horseradish is not native. I checked that, but I don't think it's native to the U.S. I think it's European. But you can get horseradish grow anywhere. Well, I, I know it grows in lots of streams in New York. I mean, is it, yeah, I'm not... I have to check on that. I thought it came from Europe, but it's not a forest plant. It has to grow in the sun, yeah. Um, a couple more I want to show you that are kind of cool, and then I'll talk a little bit about management if you guys are still with me. This one's, a, this one's a neat one that we did some great research on. This is called stone root. This is a big mint that grows about this tall. Some people might know it as horse bomb. It has a yellow flower. Um, it's called stone root, and you'll know why it's called stone root. I can pass that around. That's the rhizome. I gave, a, I gave one of these to our herb crew that was about the size of a football, and they were trying to use it, and they basically brought out, not a hatchet, they brought out an ax to break it up. But you can see how it's starting to send up plants. So, what did I, so quiz number two, what did I tell you? So the medicines, the, the compounds that are put in the plants, why do these plants put these compounds in? Defense, Defense right? So that one is, that one's real interesting. Who asked me, somebody asked me about symbiotic relationships. That's, there's a, that's the stone root, uh, Collinsonia canadensis, it's native. But there's a stone root borer moth. It's an, it's an obligate on the stone root. And what the stone root borer moth does is lay its eggs on the underside of the leaves. And then when the larvae hatch, they climb down the stem. They burrow into the root and they pupate in the root and then they come out. So that, that plant has antioxidants that we're interested in, caffeic acid and rosmeric acid. They're high, you know, everybody's crazy about antioxidants now. And Julie Larson, one of the students that I worked with a bunch of years back, she was trying to understand why this plant puts on these compounds that we're interested in. And she realized that those two compounds help with cell wall thickness in plants. That's what they use to make their cell wall thicker. So she had the brilliant idea, well maybe they put on these compounds to make the root walls, the cells thicker, so that those larvae can't burrow in. Right? So she did a simple, beautiful studies, all scientific studies that are great are just elegant and just simple. And she grew that plant and she left some alone and she took a hand drill and drilled holes in the roots of, the, of, of some and she was able to show an increase in caffeic and rosmeric acid in the ones she drilled. Mm -hmm. Just to show that that, that that was the defense. We're taking it a step further. If you can identify the stressor that causes the plant to put on the compounds you're interested in, you can grow your plants in a stressed environment 
and now they're going to have higher concentrations of the compounds you're interested in than somebody else who's growing them in good conditions and you might be able to get more money for your plants. The opposite of that is a lot of people are interested in growing these plants in agricultural settings, but if you grow them in an agricultural setting and the stressor isn't there, you might get big beautiful plants that have really low concentrations because there's no stressor. So that's another line of research we're doing at the school. Um, I think, anybody know what this, anybody know what these little guys are? No. Anybody want to guess? Really common plant. Well. Trillium. Yeah! It is. These are, these are Trillium grandiflora. Yeah, these are uh, the big white Trillium. But, you know, they look nothing like they look when they're adults. They just look like little blades of grass. Awesome, man. All right. Can you guys bear with me and I'll talk for about 15 more minutes and then I can just stay here and answer questions? You got you all are awesome. Obligate. Say again? Obligate. An obligate it has to have that plant. It's an obligate. Yeah. Like there's obligate wetland plants that have to go in wetlands. Yep. All right. Let's start this again. So where'd my click again? Oh, I, uh, I'm sure it'll come back. <laughs> I have hundreds. Yeah. Am I doing a run of time if I go in there 20 minutes? You're fine. I'm fine? Yeah, okay. Everybody's engaged. Okay, good. Good. All right. Uh, so let's start up again. Um, a lot of people have been asking questions about how do I grow these on my property? How would you manage for these? Um, so I want to switch. You know, I talked a little bit about their, their, the problem with them, their importance, and the problem with why they're so sensitive to disturbance. And then did some show and tell. And seriously, I can stay here as long as I have to. So when we're done, those of you who didn't get to see stuff or you have other questions, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, now I want to just spend another 15 minutes or so uh, talking about management of these plants, what you can do to manage them and some of the work that we're doing. So, you know, one of the questions, if you have, um, if you have some of these forest medicinals at your property and you're looking to conserve them, you want to keep these plants in your property, but you still want some timber value, right? There's nothing wrong with timber value. Um, I will argue that some of the best managed lands and some of the healthiest lands are those lands that bring economic value to the landowner. Um, it's hard to get 16-year-olds and 17-year-olds to realize that, but you know, the um, economic value is important. So one method you can use uh, in these oak systems in the eastern U.S. is something we call an oak shelterwood system. So it's, it's funny, man, um, tulip poplar. Anybody in here a big fan of tulip poplar? Oh, I got a ball, oh, Armin. You've heard all my tulip poplar jokes. There's nothing wrong with tulip poplar. Tulip poplar's fine. But any forester in the southern Appalachians that's proud of their tulip poplar stand, the, 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 tulip poplar happens. Yeah. <laughs> tulip poplar happens. Um, one of the hardest things to do in the southern Appalachians is to get oak to out-compete tulip poplar on a good site. And oak, you know, it's really easy to say all oh, foresters want oak just because it's more valuable than tulip poplar economically, but it's also so much more valuable as a wildlife food, right? What were our four wildlife species for hard mass for nuts in the Southern Appalachians? Hickory. Hickory. Oak. oak. Walnut. Walnut is there, but it's not one of the preferred. Chestnut and beech. Right? Any more chestnuts out there? No. There's no chestnuts, so those are gone. Um, beech isn't really well represented. You get pockets of it, um, but the beech bark disease is killing it up and down the East Coast. That leaves oak and hickory. And if you take an oak and you take, if you take a white oak nut and a mocker nut hickory nut and put them on a stump and come back the next day, which one's going to be gone? The oak's going to be gone. There's going to be a sign that says, "Bring me more oaks." Right? The hickory is not preferred. So, so oak is really important. And in a little side note, 
if you're ever making a decision between a red oak and a white oak on your property, always keep the white oak for wildlife because it's got less tannins, so it's less bitter, so the animals prefer that. It's a better nut for the animals. So, you know, trying to get oak to outcompete tulip poplar on a good mid-slope site is, is a real problem. And this was, a, this was developed uh, simultaneously up north uh, at, at one of the forests I work at, but also at the um, Bent Creek with David Loftus, this idea of an oak shelterwood system. The thing about oaks is when oaks are young, they're shade tolerant. Little oak seedlings are shade tolerant, and they could live as a little oak seedling for 10 years, building up biomass below ground until a gap opened up in the canopy, and then they could take off. So one of the systems that we work with with oak is this idea of an oak shelterwood system where you go in and you remove part of the canopy to keep shade on the ground to favor oaks over less shade tolerant species like tulip poplar. And then you would come in and then you would come in later on once you have healthy oaks growing and remove those larger trees and establish the oaks. Uh, for, to do this, wouldn't you have to have seedlings present? Yes, you'd have, well, seedlings of the oaks or seedlings? Oak, oak seedlings. Yeah, you have, to, you have to go in first and have oak seedlings out there. Before right? you do the shelter. Before, well, in the first, in, before you do the, when you're doing the prep cut, you need to have them. So a shelter would happens in three stages. You go in and you um, prep the ground by removing any real dense shrubbery, that type of stuff and you allow the oaks to seed in. And then you would go in and you would do your establishment cut, which would look like this, to let in enough light for those seedlings to really start taking off. And then once the seedlings have taken off, you'd remove the overwood. So it's a three-step process. Thank you, Armin. I wasn't gonna turn this into a silviculture lecture, but you did, so that's good. What's that? What are the trees that are the oaks? These are oaks. These are all beautiful oaks. And the nice thing is you leave these oaks that are, have timber value, so you come back in later, maybe 10, 15 years later, depending on how well everything grows, and you have more timber value on your land. So a way to think about an oak shelterwood system with these forest medicinals, again, if you have them out there, right? If you already have the plants out there, a way to look at it is, you know, you have this oak overstory, right? You might have some midstory. What's our midstory here? Red maple. Red maple, sourwood, black gum, right? You might have all of this. It's a 90 year old stand and you have these medicinal herbs growing down here on the ground. Medicinal herbs do not like sun, the ones that I'm talking about. Um, so if you have this mature 90 year old oak stand, you can come over here, you can do a prep cut, you can remove some of this midstory, right? It's gonna still keep shade on these plants um, but set the site for some um, seedlings to come in once you do the establishment cut. Oh. Once you do the establishment cut, you have these oak seedlings come in. These are not pines, these are oaks. Um, but you still have the forest herbs underneath some shade. And then finally, you can remove the overstory. You have your oaks established and these plants have never seen full sun through the whole process. One way to get your timber value and conserve these plants on your land, which is um, something we're trying to do. This is still theoretical. It hasn't been, it's been applied, um, but we haven't done it. No one's done it yet on a site that's really rich in medicinals. We know it'll work because a lot of these medicinals act like more of the common understory plants in a forest. They all have the same um, characteristics. So it should work uh, with that. So that's one way you can have your, har you have your, your, um, your plants and your timber. You say they are trying this at uh, Bent? Bent? Bent Creek is where this uh, uh, shelterwood system was developed in the Southern Appalachians. Dave Loftus. What's that? How old are those oaks? They, if you go up top, they did some, and the, they have some shelterwoods that they established in the 80s. Okay. Yep. If you ever go up to the top, up by Rice Pinnacle up there, there's, there's an area where you can see it, and they're all tagged. You can ride your bike or run through, and you can see the dates and what they did, which is really cool. Um, and then we've done this in Connecticut also. We have a lot of this being established in Connecticut by Mark Ashton. So another thing you could do is something we call a low thinning. This is something we do for black cohosh. We've done on the Warren Wilson campus. A low thinning is where you still keep an intact canopy, so you don't break up the canopy, but you come in and you remove the mid-story. 
And that does two things. It still keeps shade on the ground because you still have a canopy, but that shade is increased, the, the sunlight is increased a little bit so you can jumpstart some of these plants. But the other thing it does is it frees up soil moisture for those plants to grow because you're, you're taking out the mid-story and so um, you don't have all the roots sucking the water out of the soil. So you can grow the plants in there. And that's something called a low thinning or a low forest system. And um, we have had some, some luck with uh, black cohosh on this. Uh, Armin, do you recognize this site? Not at all. This is the walnut site. Yeah. So um, that we just opened up, we're doing. Uh, uh, Armin is infamous at Warren Wilson campus. Armin is um, the one who came up with the idea, did not listen to me say it was a bad idea, and um, now we have a pretty thriving walnut syrup operation on campus. So we're making walnut syrup. Oh, yeah. What's that? I the black walnut, will you still be able to grow those plants? Uh, on the edges, um, what we're doing here is we're doing a low thinning for sheep in there also. So this is going to be black walnut and sheep. So this is what a low thinning would look like, is what I'm getting at here, yep. So low thinnings are something else you can do to keep some shade on the ground. Um, this is one that we're doing that's fascinating. Any of you who, um, does this picture look weird to anybody? Yeah. That, that does ginseng? How, how many, how, who's, who has found ginseng in the wild? How often do you find it under white pine, pure white pine? It de generally doesn't grow under white pine. It needs these hardwood stands, right? The white pine stands aren't the type of site that they grow under. But I went to visit a fella um, up by App State who our forest manager said, Dave, um, we got to go visit this guy who's growing ginseng under white pine. And I said, I said that's, that's nonsense. I don't have time to go up there and look at that. Um, he said, no, Dave, we got to go look at it. I'm telling you, it's working. So we went up there and looked at it, and it's brilliant. It's a young white pine stand that's on a hardwood site. So the soils are hardwood soils because soils take a century to change. So it's a young pine site um, that pines were planted on. They're only about 20 years old. And then under the pine, the ginseng was, was seeded in. So it provides, the pine provides the shade, but it's still hardwood site. We started doing this at Warren Wilson. So this is a pine stand that we did something called a third row thinning. We took out every third row of pine and we planted ginseng and seed into the third row. But those are Virginia pines. They're not white pines. No, these are white pines. Yep. Would it grow under Virginia too? Um, I don't see why not. Yeah, you have to be careful though, because young uh, Virginia pines can look like a young stand, but it could be an older stand. And a lot of times, Virginia pine down here comes in an old agricultural land, so you got to be a little careful. Those have furry leaves. Yeah, those are um, one-year-old plants. So that's not poisonous. What's that? Uh, not poisonous. Oh no, there's some plants that have three leaves that aren't. Um, but this is, this is a ginseng. No, this isn't poison ivy. But these have three leaves. So that's what a young one-year-old ginseng germinant looks like with just three leaves. It doesn't get the prongs until the second year. So we're growing it under this white pine, which is awesome. So think about it this way. Somebody, you know, one of the things we won't do in this, and I get frustrated with it, look up Michigan ginseng on the internet. And what you'll find is these oak stands, these beautiful oak stands that have just been tilled. And there's nothing growing under them but dense ginseng. And they, have to, they grow it so dense they have to use fungicides and they have to use uh, herbicides and quite often they have to fertilize. I don't think that's any better than corn. Even though it's ginseng, it's no better than corn. So we have a rule on the Warren Wilson forest that we'll never plant at a density that displaces native biodiversity. Right? Plant with native biodiversity. And we don't want to plant the ginseng at a density um, that requires fungicide because if ginseng grows too close together, it gets hit by some funguses. So we only plant it um, at uh, one ounce of seeds per hundred square feet is what we plant it at. And that's the, that's the area you can do it. But think about it this way. These young pine stands, there's no biodiversity under there to displace. 
Right? So they're perfect. And the other thing for a landowner, there's no economic value in this stand for another 40 or 50 years. All of a sudden, oh, you've got economic value while you're waiting for your timber to grow, which is pretty awesome. So we're trying to, um, we're, we're, we're doing this, we're doing research. Why does that keep happening? We're doing this, um, we're doing research on this. Abby Doyle, who's a student, has just done some research. What did I tell you about the ginseng? Why, what makes it valuable? Bifurcation. The bifurcation makes it valuable, right? So what we're doing is looking at the difference between the, the roots that are grown under pine and the roots that are grown under hardwood. We're getting the bifurcation, right? We're getting some bifurcation. There's some that didn't get it. But you notice how much smaller these are after two years compared to these? So it's not growing as well as it does in the typical hardwood stands, but it's still growing. You're still going to get economic value from it. So this is something else, you know, one of, one of the things that, that we're doing um, and I'll bring up our last, uh, I'll bring up the last bit. I've been blathering on to you guys long enough. Um, one of the things we're doing at Warren Wilson is propagating these plants, right? So <clears throat> a lot, we lose a lot of land in the Southern Appalachians. We lose a lot of land throughout the US. When that land is not seen as productive by the landowner and they're not getting economic value from it. You might own 200 acres, your pine isn't due for 60 years. Your oak isn't due for 60 years. You're paying taxes on the land. You got a couple kids getting ready to go to college. Sometimes people have to sell land because they're not getting economic value. So we're using these medicinal plants and their economic value as a conservation mechanism for conserving land. The idea is if we can get landowners who might be on the edge of selling their land to grow these plants on their property to get some economic revenue to maybe make their land revenue neutral, pay your taxes, we're not talking about getting rich, all of a sudden these plants can be a conservation tool that reduces the economic incentive for selling your land because it's costing you money. So what we're doing, now one of the problems is these plants A are not on your property, right? They're just not there. Um, the technical skills that are needed to grow these plants from seeds are really, really difficult. We've been working on it for five, six years now, and we're about halfway through the species that we want. But the other side of these plants is, you know what's the hardest thing about growing ginseng? Not getting it stolen. Not getting it stolen. <laughs> you know? So these plants, for the most part, if you have land, you could put these plants out on your land, and you know, most people aren't tending their land. They live it, they work in Asheville, they work somewhere else. Um, they don't want to be tending the plants, but you don't have to tend them. You put them in the ground and you come back six years later and dig them up if it's a good site and no one else has stolen them. So it's a low impact way for people to get economic value from their land. And what we're doing, um, this is our propagation shade house, which has been doubled by now. But we are um, doing and trademarking a guaranteed from seed, never wild harvested plant from Warren Wilson. These are ramps. These are wild ginger. These are um, jack in the pulpit. Uh, golden seal. This is black cohosh over here. Ginseng over here. We're propagating these plants from seed. Never taking them from the wild. We're selling them to nurseries so that we can educate folks to use these in their shade gardens. And we're going to make them available in the next year or two to landowners to outplant on their land to get economic value. The great thing we're doing is the students are willing and able to write forest management plans for people that includes these plants. And then the students not only propagate the plant, but can bring them out and help the landowner put them on the land. And then um, we're trying to figure out some type of cost sharing down the road for cost sharing uh, harvesting. I'm hoping to do it all through grants so we can make these plants available to landowners for nothing, which would be gay. Or supplement this side of it, the land side of it, by selling to nurseries. Um, I just, you know, it's funny, I just sold a load of plants to a nursery and about $500 worth of plants. 
that would have made about 50 cents worth of medicine. <laughs> so tell me, tell me where that, tell me, <laughs> do the feasibility study on which one, you know, you have there. So, you know, if anyone wants to talk to me, we're not ready to put plants out on people's land right now, um, but we're going to have these plants available. Uh, what it takes is three years of plants before we can have a steady, uh, steady stream. But I have about 5,000 black cohosh now. I've got uh, probably 5,000 golden seal right now and, and all of these plants available. And the last thing I'll say about it is I want everybody to realize um, doing this is not me doing this. You know, it's Warren Wilson doing it through the work in the research program. These are students doing this work. So when we sell these plants, we're supporting students in research, um, which, is, which is wonderful. Uh, let me run through a couple quick photos. That's a blue cohosh flower. Really pretty. That's the blue cohosh flowers compared to that big white plume for black cohosh. There's the bloodroot flower. That's a really pretty plant. I love bloodroot. Uh, uh, remember I talked about the unicorn root? The one that's really slow growing? These are the seeds. That's how small they are. They're like a maple seed. They have a little wing on them. But they still fall from this high, so they might wind up there. Right? Um, these are the bloodroot seeds. These are the pods. And then when they pop open, you can see those little appendages on them that the ants eat. Um, this is black cohosh, how it grows in a big habit right here with the, in there. Um, this is, anyone know what these are? Jack and Jack. This is, this is one of my favorite woodland plants. This is Jack in the Pulpit, the seed pod. And this is, with a lot of these seeds, what you have to do, what I'll take with this is so, uh, let it sit in water and ferment and let the pericarp, the fleshy part, um, uh, rot off. And with a lot of them, like blue cohosh, there's a germination inhibitor in there and you have to get that off for them to germinate. Once you've done everything you just said, how long can you keep those seeds before they're not viable? That's a great question. Um, I, uh, viability goes down quick. Like the black cohosh seeds, those little tiny seeds, I, I put them in the same day. I find if I let them sit for a few weeks, the viability starts going down. So you can buy these seeds like on the open market. I'll tell you what, I'll get 95% germination there, but if I buy a packet of seeds from Prairie, New, Prairie Moon Nursery, and I'm not saying they're a bad place, but they sell the seeds, and they've been stored for a year or something, you might get 40% germination. So they, they really need to go quickly. Um, those are beautiful. Those are uh, golden seal seeds. They're really hard, black ebony seeds. I don't know what else I have in here. These are ramp. They look like, these are ramp seedlings. They look like grass. When they come up, there's an older ramp that put out the seeds, and here's the, here's the seeds, uh, seedlings. <sighs> Thank you for listening.